Welcome to the special meeting of the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Commission on Monday, February 26th, 2018. May we have the roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner Zasatrian? Here. Kalfayan? Yes. Wolfson? Here. Wu absent. President Michaels? Present. Item 1A, the agenda for the February 26, 2018 special meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall on or before Friday, February 23rd, 2018. Item number two, upcoming council agenda items. Thank you, President Michaels, members of the commission. Uh, we have a few items coming up this next month. Uh, tomorrow night, actually, February 27th, we have acceptance of grant funds from LA County Probation Department for the Glendale Youth Alliance Program. <laughs> and we also have acceptance of grant funds from Dignity Health uh, for the One Glendale After School Youth Sports Program. Uh, staff is also working on a long-term use agreement with the Dads Club. We'll either go on Mar uh, March 6th or the 13th. Uh, we're working on it. The report has not been submitted yet. Thank you. Next item. Item three, commission staff comments. No comments. Are there any comments? I did receive comments from the public regarding a ADA access issue at Dunsmore Park. I've talked with staff about that. We will be addressing that issue and following up with the people who made comments, as well as concerns about some of the trash cans that were blown in the wind. I will be following up with staff on those issues. I, we ready for the next item? Uh, President Michael, if I may, I'd like to go over some upcoming calendar events for the department. Please. Thank you. Uh, March 1st, GY Summer Employment Opportunities. Applications will be accepted beginning March 1st. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to contact 818-937-8073. March 2nd, 16th, and 30th, we have Teen Night Out at the Pacific Community Center between 5.30 and 9 p.m. Trails and Open Space Friday Night Lecture, Urban Hike Historic Highlights of Southern Glendale will be taking place at the Glendale Transportation Center on March 3rd between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. We have a community meeting coming up regarding master planning of Verdugo Park North at the Civic Auditorium on March 5th between 6.30 and 8 p.m. We have Zumba for adults and seniors at Maple Park Community Center beginning every Tuesday on March 6th from 9 a.m. to 10.30 in the morning. Trails and Open Space Friday Night Lecture, Wildlife and You, Their Hope for the Future at Brand Studios on March 9th between 6.30 and 8.30 p.m. Riverwalk Workday on March 10th, 2018, between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. at Glendale Neverose Riverwalk. Sixth Annual Veterans Job Fair at McCambridge Recreation Center in Burbank, California, on March 15th, between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. Youth and Family Services Healthy Snacks Workshop for Teens at the Pacific Community Center on March 16, 2018, at 6 p.m. Trails and Open Space Hike Medicinal Plants of the West at Duke Magian Wilderness Park on March 17, 2018, between 9 a.m. and noon. One Glendale After School Youth Sports Program Basketball Championship Day at the Pacific Community Center on March 17th. Consolation game will begin at 10 a.m., followed by the championship game at 11 a.m. Intro to the Joe Japanese Stick Fighting at Brand Park on March 18th, between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Commission meeting will meet back in the council chambers on March 19th at 2.30 in the afternoon. We have Glendale Midweek Munchies at parking lot 31 located on the corner of Verdugo Road and Mountain Street on March 21st between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. Wilderness Workday, the Wilderness Act at Duke Majin Wilderness Park on March 24, 2018 between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. Spring Extravaganza at the Pacific Community Center and Park at on March 31st, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., followed by the Cesar Chavez 17th Annual Celebration event on the same date, March 31st, 2018, between 1 and 3 p.m. For more information, you are well, more than welcome to contact 818-548-2000 or visit our home one page at glendalecagovernor slash resident slash calendar. Thank you. Um, can you briefly uh, talk about the agenda for the Verdugo uh, Park uh, meeting, that community meeting we're going to have? Sure. President Michaels, members of the commission, uh, we had a uh, community meeting in June regarding master planning of the park. <coughs> the consultant was there and uh, provided, uh, basically we 
uh, receive feedback from the community in attendance on what they would like to see at the park. Uh, our consultant developed three uh, proposals and we, were we are going to uh, uh, talk about the three proposals uh, that our consultant brought up. Uh, that's what the meeting is on March 5th. And we're gonna pick one of the three so we can ask our consultant to go into uh, the design, uh, design phase, the schematic design. Have the, so this is the unveiling of the, of the three designs? The three designs, yes. And the individuals that are gonna be present basically are gonna uh, give feedback on which one? Which one, yes. Uh, they prefer? And is that the only community meeting we're gonna have after? Yes, after that which will be the last one. Decision? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> what, what are the plans? Uh, basic plan, what is it? Basic plans is uh, <laughs> there will be a walk path um, a DG walk path around the north end of Verdugo Park with exercise equipment, a brand new bathroom building with a small meeting room. We wanted a nice 3,200 square foot facility, but the community came out and said, we want something smaller. Uh, so we decided to have a small room for our day camp program and for special events. Uh, brand new playground, Shane's Inspiration Playground, and moving the community garden to the west end of the park so we have more open space and a historic village on the north end um, which is all part of the conception <coughs> we will have enough park, uh, space for uh, guests to come and uh, enjoy the weekend there. yes there will be some ada access and ada uh, parking available are there plans for soccer fields uh, within the renovations i've gotten some phone calls actually opposing that at the park at the at park just asking if they're with you know within the new designs or no there will be no the soccer field there. Not, okay. no thank you no we currently have a number of soccer fields uh in the planning stages one at wilson middle school one at cerritos elementary and one at fremont park thank you so much will the plans be posted online for those who can't attend the meeting but do want to comment yes after the meeting we will post the plans The next item. Item four, oral communications. I have one card for Roberta Medford. <clears throat> Hello. Thank you, President Michaels, commission, staff, uh, viewers. Uh, I am Roberta Medford, and I'm here representing Glendale Beautiful. Um, our chair of Arbor Day this year is uh, Chris Chorbanian, and he is at work right now, so I am here reminding the community and uh, that um, Arbor Day will be celebrated in Glendale on uh, next Tuesday, a week, a week from tomorrow, on March 6th um, at the Casa Dobi de San Rafael on Dorothy Street, as usual, Dorothy Drive, excuse me. Um, the important deadline, however, is this coming Thursday, uh, um, February 28th, which is the deadline to uh, donate a tree or trees if you wish to uh, be recognized at the Arbor Day observance with our nice certificates. And um, on the screen, I believe now, at glendalebeautiful.org is our uh, web page from which you can download a printed form and mail it in right away by uh, this Thursday, the 28th, or um, pay online and donate with a credit card. Um, the event, of course, is um, put on by Glendale Beautiful, but uh, in, with the cooperation of Glendale um, Parks and Community Services, and, and we really appreciate all their work. And um, we invite the community to participate and celebrate the, um, the trees, and especially the lovely trees that beautify um, our city. And, and help keep them strong and healthy. And if you uh, have any questions, uh, please let me know. I do have some forms if any of you still need to donate a tree or know people that might want to do that. So I'll leave them here. And um, remember, uh, March 6th at the Casa Adobe Arbor Day. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, what time is the event at? Ready for the next item? 
item five, consent items. At eight, approval of the minutes of the commission special meeting held on January 22nd, 2018. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move it. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Sautrian? Stain. Kalfayan? Yes. Wolfson? Yes. Wu absent. President Michaels? Yes. Item six, action item A, motion to review and provide feedback on the CSP 2017 Senior Needs Assessment Report. What I'd like to do is go ahead and pull item 7A and take that now and turn that over to Mr. Panosian to give his report and presentation. For the record, we're moving out of order item 6A, replacing with 7A. Thank you, President Michaels, members of the commission. Uh, the item today is the restoration of the uh, Whispering Pine Social Cheyenne Tea House. We had mentioned this project to you back in December and January and wanted to uh, recognize some of the staff that worked on it. But before we do, we have a presentation we'd like to show you about what took place, the background of the project, and show you some pictures of the progress and then the final end product that we had. As you know, uh, the tea house is located uh, with the pond, is located at Brand Park, and it is an ideal spot for a lot of our residents and non-residents to come in and hold special events, weddings, take pictures. Uh, we have the, the tea house, the pond, and the waterfall at the end, uh, north end of the, uh, the, the pond itself. Project background. The city was approached by the Consul General of Japan in Los Angeles, and they told us that they like to offer support in restoration of the tea house grounds. Uh, the goal was to depict the culturally accurate setting of the tea house, the Machia area, and uh, the support would consist of in kind donations, such as their expert designers, expert landscapers, as well as some materials. A Japanese delegation arrived in Glendale August 2017, August 8th and 9th. We held meetings with them. Our staff, uh, Friends of Soshayan, uh, our local nonprofit group that oversees some of the activities at the uh, Tea House, along with the delegation. Uh, m members of the Japanese delegation included the Japanese consulate, the Japan Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Japan Foundation members from Japan traveled here. Japan Foundation members from Los Angeles, uh, gardening experts and TL specialists from Japan. We had Maestro Hiru, uh, Hirumo uh, Terashita and Yasuma Saimara. We also had a local job, uh, Japanese gardening expert who's been working with us, volunteering and keeping up the, uh, the grounds, helping with some tree framing with Dirk, Kazuhiko Nakanishi. Project planning. During this meeting, we spent two days in assessing the current conditions at the facility, identifying areas of concern, uh, began creating a design uh, for the use of the Maichi area, the new landscape, expanding of the waterfall, develop a scope of work, and then uh, start planning for the restoration in January 2018, where some of the delegation members, the governing experts, along with other subcontractors, were going to travel back to the U.S. to work with our staff side by side to see this project uh, through. The project scope of work we identified First would be the back area of the tea house to open that up as the entrance to the tea house. Currently, they use the front entrance because the back was not designed for accurately uh, accepting people coming into the tea house for the ceremonies. Relocating and replacing the stepping stones, um, the isolating the Maishia era from the rest of the park to give it more of an inclusive uh, a feeling when you're actually having the tea ceremony. Relandscaping the garden, re relocating the uh, lanterns, relocating the tsukubai, installing a new tap, pruning the trees bonsai style, and expanding the, uh, redesigning the waterfall. This is what it looked like when we began our uh, process. This was the Maichiai area where people wait in this back area and before the tea ceremony starts, a representative who's hosting the tea ceremony will come out and escort people into the tea house. This is uh, the Tsukubai where they wash their hands part of the ceremony before they enter the tea house. And this is where the designing came into place. Just sitting there at a table for two days, the experts started planning their ideas as to what they would like to see after walking the grounds. What you see in round are the stepping stones. They figured they would design it differently to allow for better uh, uh, traffic in the area. What they decided to do was build a fence to isolate the park from the, the Tsukubai area. 
and then looked at some of the landscaping, how they can improve the landscaping to be more culturally depictive of what it would be in Japan, as well as uh, moving the lantern on the right over here. And what you see on the left is literally starting to measure and uh, uh, building of the fence in centimeters, which was a little uh, challenging for us to begin with because we're not used to centimeters. I, we don't remember a lot of the elementary school education we received. And then after they got to Japan, the uh, uh, Maestro Terashita actually sent us these potential concept designs for the waterfall, what he envisioned them to be. Uh, the top one being what it currently looks like, and the other two are alternatives that we could consider. This was the design team delegation members. The mayor was uh, available in the morning to meet and greet the delegation members and appreciate the, uh, the efforts put forth by, by the Dev Japanese delegation. And we went to the grounds, identified issues related to trees, uh, assessing our current trees, what should be, how they should be planted, what modifications we need to have. We started designing the stepping stones, as you see on the left, what would be ideal, what size uh, stones we should have for the walking, starting design the Tsukubai area, how we would be moved over to the right, where you see the, uh, hard to see, but the yellow uh, ropes pulled over, that's where the fencing would go and spent the two days designing the entire work. After the Japanese delegation left, we were tasked with preparing for the restoration work, which included identifying and delivering large boulders from the Meijin Wilderness Park, uh, building the Maichi I fence, which staff did uh, prior to uh, the, the delegation's arrival the second time around, uh, demoing the existing waterfall, having materials ready so that literally within six days, this entire project had to be concluded in a six day time frame. It was a very uh, a liberal, <laughs> Uh, timeline, to, to, to say the least. These are some of the boulders at Duke Majin that staff had to go and sort through, identify which ones would be ideal for the waterfall, as well as some of the smaller rocks that would be uh, ideal for the stepping stones. They have to be of specific size, have a flat surface so it doesn't you know, create any tripping. Uh, we actually had gone to this site when they were first year delegation members and Maestro Terashita identified the types of stones he would like to see, hence gave us an idea what to look for and then began the construction of the fence. Uh, these were redwood, and one of our, one of our own Chris Peplo, as you know, uh, as he always does, started doing this work at his house. Most of the prep work for these wooden fence was done at his own time, at his own home, uh, making a mess at home rather than at the yard itself. And I have to say, I love Ms. Teresa Peplo for allowing him and the time to do this. That is his wife. Every inch or every centimeter of the, the wooden fence had to be measured and truthfully uh, uh, done to the centimeter or millimeter because the way he built this fence, it would not require any nails or any screws to be able to do it. This was done fully by inwood and each one would fit, each portion of the fence would fit into the other one with small little, uh, what do you call them, small dowels to be able to hold it together. You can see the little pieces that are cut out and you'll get an idea what those are for. Each one of the uh, pegs, you see square holes that were made because square, I've learned that apparently is better than the round, especially if you're using um, uh, wooden little uh, pegs to actually hold them together because the round shifts and turns, square holes in place. A lot to learn. And you can see the grooves are done after he cut and designed everything, brought them back to the yard and started the construction of the fence. As you can see, every one of those uh, two by fours had to fit perfectly within the groove in each size. And here's how he comes in with the, uh, the glue. And you can see, uh, it's hard to see with this, but right about there where he's putting uh, the little grooves to hold them together. And here's one of the fences constructed, ready to go to, in place. In January, the Japanese delegation returned. They had approximately nine to 10 members that helped out throughout the week. And we worked January 16th through the 23rd to complete the work. This is the old waterfall area where we started de uh, demolishing the existing waterfall. These are the pipes that fed the water to the waterfall. What we had to do in order to make this a reality, we had to move those over by six feet or so to reconnect, the, cut off the pipe and reconnect it to be able to extend it by 12 to 15 feet behind the original existing. So we identified, found where the water, li water lines are. We cut it, trenched, extended the water lines all the way to the back. Uh, typical irrigation, the staff were here, you've seen some of these pictures before, connected all of the lines, and we finally ended up with two posts sticking where the new waterfall is gonna be, and then a clean out down below uh, where the smaller pipe is. Meanwhile, oh, they even trusted me to run some equipment. Uh, 
Felipe is looking at me, making sure I'm not making any mistakes. Um, meanwhile, we're moving, continue to moving some of the large boulders over to waterfall area. And there were quite a bit to choose from. We let the, ma the masters decide which one of those boulders are gonna go where. Because in his vision, which possibly changed on a daily basis with the work scope, uh, Maestro had an ideal vision and he worked through the entire process making adjustments on a daily basis to see his vision come through. This was quite challenging working in very small tight areas. As you can see, the boulders are human size. Um, and after everything was moved, placed in place, in their place, continued working throughout the week and trying to build a waterfall. At the same time, we had a crew working on the opposite side starting to remove the stepping stones because this had to be in conjunction. Time-wise, time, time -wise, it was very, very narrow timeline. And uh, this is the back area of the tea house. One of the things that had to be done is this stone, the large stone that you see was opposite direction. And it created a not accurate setting. So we, we were required to re reverse it to the other one, opposite area, and had to trip off some of the uh, stones to make it more flat. This would be the new entry to the tea house. And every stone that was placed was measured and accurately placed in place. Uh, what you see them working on here is the lantern, the UV lantern that was moved from the front of the tea house, from the other side of the tea house. And then staff had to yet again measure and uh, identify where the posts are gonna go. And again, given that we're not using any screws to uh, uh, hold this together, it had to be accurate to the millimeter. Especially not just the line, also the depth had to be perfect. And after the holes were dug, the fences were put in, they were secured and held in place. And as you can see, this, uh, this is towards the end of the installation where the footings were uh, concreted in. Meanwhile, the, when we moved to Tsukabai, the hand washing station, we had to pull, uh, before they used to use uh, water, just carrying water over to this area. We figured while we're doing this, our staff pulled a new water line to install a new tap for them to use. And to make it more culturally accurate, we used a bamboo to cover it all. So after it was said and done, we have a, a nicely, uh, perfectly set up uh, Tsukubai area where staff is working on making this so that you could turn on a switch and then the water will flow during the ceremony and then you can turn off the switch and we won't need the water any longer. Uh, this is yet again in the back side of the tea house where they started preparing for the final touches of the entryway. Uh, at the same time, part of his vision, Maestro saw a wall in the back of the waterfall. Uh, and they started constructing that every stone pick was chiseled so it'd be a perfect flat flush surface on both sides. A lot of effort went in to uh, building this, this wall. And then we first turned on the waterfall and this was probably the most exciting there for me seeing the water flow for the first time. Yet it wasn't the end of the project. Uh, the vision was to install river rock around the entire perimeter inside of the pond to prevent from debris and uh, dirt from rains flowing into the pond, trying to keep it clean. Stepping stones were placed on both sides, so you can literally walk across the, uh, the waterfall at the north end. And then the landscaping came into play. We uh, probably installed about 2,000, 2,500 square feet of sod in the areas that were impacted. Uh, planting continued. We planted several trees, a lot of bonsai trees. And this is the back end while they're putting in the, uh, uh, the river rock and the pebbles to give it the final uh, clean look. And here's a finalized look at the, uh, the waterfall and the wall in the back. This was Mastro's vision, as you can see, kind of made it very close to, as a matter of fact, I believe he did this after he finished the construction. He sketched it and sent it to us, which is a very beautiful uh, sketch that he did. And this is the waterfall as it currently uh, exists, the final finished product. So we went from this, what you saw into uh, this little entryway, the improvement that they envisioned initially. We went from this Sukubai area to this, uh, uh, where it could also be used for the holding space for if you're having a wedding, the bride and the groom need to make an entry, this could be also used for that. Uh, this is a shot of, uh, from east to west, uh, I'm sorry, west to east of the waterfall area with the black pines. Um, this is a shot of the pond. Yet again, another one from the north end. As you can see, the entire perimeter of the pond was landscaped with sod and other uh, uh, landscape uh, plants in the area. And here is a final shot of the, uh, the tea house from looking from uh, east to west. 
Here is our project crew members. It has some of our project crew staff members as well as uh, our colleagues from Japan. We came very close throughout the process. Our staff learned a lot, they learned a lot. Even though initially it was a bit, you know, culturally and language barriers came into play, but by the sixth day it seemed like we're speaking the same language all around. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize some of the staff that worked on this project. Um, I'm gonna call them up to have them introduce themselves and allow uh, President Michaels to uh, uh, grant their certificates. Before I do that, I wanna give you an idea about the project cost. The materials and labor cost for the city, labor cost was approximately $25,000 for this. Materials, $9,500 worth, and then labor at 15,962. We asked our, uh, the Japanese consulate in LA who have been our uh, liaisons in communicating with Japan as to what are some of the in-kind donations estimates from Japan. And their estimates were at $57,600 in-kind donations, of which 27, almost $28,000 in lodging and travel. They, they flew out of here twice in large groups. And uh, the entire time they were working, they were staying at a local hotel. And then there, we wanted to know what would it have been if we had paid for their subcontract work. And they're estimated that a technical expert in subcontractors at $27,000. Materials, they had ordered some materials pre-delivered predetermined and delivered to us the week before that they paid for at about $1,860 and then some miscellaneous expenses they incurred at $464. Uh, if the commission has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Uh, meanwhile, I'd like to call our staff uh, to the podium and introduce themselves. That will be you guys. Yes. Please come all at once, so uh, take turns introducing yourself and uh, let us know your position, what you do for us. At, at this point, I'd like to ask my fellow commissioners to go down and be able to hand out the certificates as people speak at the podium. Hi, I'm Chris Peplo, the Park Services Manager. Good afternoon, my name is Francisco Montano. I'm the Senior Irrigation Tech. Uh, Mike Persigian, Irrigation Tech. Good afternoon, I'm Sergio Corral. I'm a Senior Groundskeeper. My name is Felipe Sanchez. I'm working for Project Crew. I'm going to Groundskeeper too. My name is Eric Nuno, and I'm a Groundskeeper One. Good afternoon, I'm Ricardo Montavo. I'm a Irrigation Technician. Good afternoon, my name is Antonio Montes. I'm an uh, Irrigation Technician. At this point, I'd like to invite everyone back to the podium, invite Mr. Panosian, the rest of staff to come down for a photo to commemorate this.
present. Michael, we also had a couple of our uh, two volunteers and one of our staff members who cannot be here with us today would like to recognize them as well. One of our staff members, Mr. Hugo Barrios, groundskeeper one, is uh, not with us today, is unable to join us. And we had two volunteers from the local Japanese gardening group who were there every day working side by side with us, Mr. Matsuo Takahashi and then Mr. Kazuhiko Nakanashi. Nakanishi, excuse me. Um, we'll be happy to pass these certificates on to them. And on behalf of the team, we appreciate your recognition of the work done by the staff. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the commission, I'll let the commissioner speak as well to express our appreciation for the work that was done, for the vision that was created, and for the execution that came out flawlessly. Oh, I think it looks beautiful, and I can't wait to visit it in person. I'd like to echo our appreciation. Um, I also wanted to know what we're doing with respect to PR on, on this and letting the community know, because I, both with respect to the work of the staff and the, uh, the new grounds that we have, I'd, I'd really like some additional marketing PR on it for, for the community at large to know. Uh, yes, uh, President Michaels, uh, Commissioner Satoria, and yes, that's something we'll be working on. Tomorrow at Council, they'll be recognizing some of the staff members as well as the work done, uh, Mayor's recognition, Mayor's commendation, as well as through our uh, marketing efforts in marketing the tea house. Now we'll be marketing the revised new uh, uh, tea house landscape and grounds, as well as our friends of Soshayan, who are the keepers of the tea house, our volunteer group. They will be helping us as they do their events. They'll be promoting and marketing the tea house as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> it's a treasure for Glendale. Thank you for doing a good job. Again, thank you for coming, giving us the opportunity to express our appreciation. I also will coordinate with staff and send a letter of thanks from the commission to the delegation that helped make this possible. Next item, please. Uh, President Michaels, would you like to move up to uh, action items or would you like to move forward with reports? Let's move to 6A action items. Okay. Uh, before we move forward, I'd just like, for the record, would like to um, state that we just had a presentation on item 7A, restoration of the Shoshane Whispering Pine Tea House and Friendship Garden. Um, moving back to order item six, action A, motion to re review and provide feedback on the CSP 2017 Senior Needs Assessment Report. Good afternoon, President Michaels, members of the commission and staff. I'm Maggie Kavarian with the Senior Services Unit. I'm here to present the Senior Needs Assessment 2017 report. Back in May of 2017, um, Council had asked if we could do a feasibility study of a senior services committee or the possibility of a senior services committee. And basically what we wanted to do, what we wanted to do was give a historical perspective on that. In 1981, um, the Greater Glendale Council on Aging had formed as a nonprofit. It, the numbers started dwindling down in the 2000s as the members started retiring themselves and um, moved out of the area. And up until today, their nonprofit status has been suspended. Additionally, um, there's an Astra group, which is assisting seniors through enhanced resources. They're a fantastic group similar to a senior services committee. However, their focus is on seniors in the foothill communities of Glendale and not all of greater Glendale. We also um, asked leaders in the aging services field at the local area hospitals what their thoughts were on a senior services committee. And at Glendale, uh, Adventist Health Glendale, they did not have any sort of committee, but they were very excited to be part of something if we were gonna create something like that, as did Dignity Health Glendale Memorial. 
USC Verdugo Hills actually has a committee, but their committee is a community-based advisory board, and it doesn't de just deal with the aging population, it deals with all populations. So we knew we had a starting point, and that starting point was we needed to conduct a senior needs assessment. And what were we looking at? Well, the senior services unit collaborated together and decided that we needed to identify needs and gaps in senior services, we needed to improve overall section efficiency and identify high value areas for improvement and expansion or innovation. We needed to evaluate the needs to create and implement a senior services committee. And then we needed to identify the sustainable approach for establishing priorities and procedures to meet the needs of um, seniors 60 years, or 60 years and older in Glendale. We used four pathways to get to this. And how do we gather our information? We knew that we wanted to have a senior survey um, created. We wanted to get input from stakeholders, which were professionals in the senior field. So we wanted to have a focus group meeting. We also wanted to continue those interviews, that, those one-on-one -on -one interviews with the aging care leaders. And then, of course, we wanted to um, have best practices. So our focal question was, how do we serve seniors or service seniors more effectively? Well, we knew we wanted to keep seniors in their homes longer, provide an array of services to optimize quality of life, and then ensuring those who are most frail and sick are identified and accessing resources, because that is technically our mission of Senior Services Unit. The methodology that we used was we gathered, um, we had eight domains that we took from the AARP Network of Age-Friendly Cities. And then our senior staff decided we needed four more that we felt were important to the seniors of Glendale. And so I'll tell you what our, our staff wanted. Our staff definitely thought that food security was important, activity, activities of daily living was important, legal and advocacy as a domain was important, and of course, emergency preparedness. We, always, we felt that those four domains were very important as well as the other eight. So we created and distributed a senior survey, again, using those 12 domains. Each domain was rated based on a level of concern and priority, high priority, medium priority, low priority, or if the senior just doesn't know, don't know. 200 surveys were distributed throughout Glendale at our community centers, libraries, senior apartment complexes, to our homebound clients that we service, um, hospitals, and then we received 147 completed and returned surveys back. On October 25th, we held our focus group meeting with our community stakeholders. We had 37 stakeholders attend that meeting. They broke out into five respective groups and they discussed the 12 domains, just like the senior survey had those 12 domains. So the analysis plan was taking the senior survey and the focus group question, uh, focus group uh, responses, and we asked, what are the three top priorities affecting seniors in the Glendale community? And the results were in. The results for the top three priority domains for seniors surveyed were housing, number one, communication and information, and emergency preparedness. Those were the three domains that seniors felt were really important to them and they were a priority in Glendale. As for the focus group, they felt that housing, communication and information, and transportation were important to seniors in the community. So as you can see, housing and communication and information have an overlap with both groups. And then we have a chart here showing the senior um, surveys that we graphed. As we gathered all the information and put everything together, we decided that there are six key recommendations that needed to be made with all this new information at hand. We know we had to develop housing strategies for seniors to find alternative housing options because we, knew, we know in, in this climate, housing is a huge problem with um, seniors trying to find affordable housing and um, that was definitely number one. 
we knew that we have to create a senior services committee because that was something that we realized with the communication and information being the second priority for both groups that the focus group really wanted to meet. Developing an intra-agency plan to educate seniors on emergency preparedness. We didn't realize how important that was, even though we created that domain, but we didn't realize how important that was to seniors. Working with Senior Services Network of Stakeholders to develop and provide trainings on health care and caregiver training and support because they, the focus group felt that that was very important. Work with Senior Services Network of Stakeholders to promote senior safety by providing educational workshops regarding senior fraud, scams, elder abuse, and pedestrian safety which affects Glendale seniors. And then last but not least, become a member of the AARP Age-Friendly Network of Cities in 2018 to make a commitment to actively work towards making City of Glendale a greater place for people of all ages. We knew that that was something that we definitely wanted to do. So in conclusion, staff definitely recommends supporting the creation of a Senior Services Committee that will meet quarterly and be comprised of seniors, senior advocates, and senior services professionals in Glendale who are community stakeholders. Any questions? I know it's a lot to digest. <laughs> question. <laughs> um, so I have, I've written down some questions. Maybe I can school them or just kind of group them together. Um, how were surveys collected? They were collected through um, what we did was we, we distributed surveys throughout the, the community centers, the libraries, the complexes, and they were written surveys. So they were, uh, you would have to do a, a write-in, and then we would get the surveys back either from the seniors themselves or from the complex managers, the, um, the supervisors at the sites. It just depended on where they were given out. Uh, what language were the surveys in? The surveys were um, in English only but we had translators helping seniors that needed that. And what language were those? In Armenian and in Spanish. Um, did the city itself provide assistance with translation? Well, the two people that I know personally that were helping were two case managers who happened to be um, Spanish speaking and Armenian speaking. Um, I know that there is a growing population of uh, Filipinos and Korean community that um, also need that. Um, perhaps we can look at how we can address that in the future Definitely do to that. make sure um, we're assisting them as well. Um, did you guys collect background uh, uh, breakdown for the individuals that submitted surveys? We did not. We actually, when we collaborated, we wanted to do something similar to that, but we know that LA County was doing their own needs assessment and we noticed a lot of issues they were having with that. And the reason we didn't do it was, their issue was it was too long. And when the survey is way too long, seniors will not complete it. See, the county survey had 13 pages to it. Even with our translation help, even when we pushed it over the summer, this is before we did our own survey, even when we tried pushing that, they just wouldn't complete them. Not because they couldn't complete them, they just didn't want to, they were just too long for them. So we knew we wanted to condense it so we get the, the basic information that we needed for our um, senior services committee, if whether we wanted a senior services committee, was it feasible or not. So how will you be determining um, that you have a you know, proper representation of the different segments of our community within the survey results? Well, we were looking more towards the, the needs, the certain needs that the seniors were having. Even though we do have that information in our um, system because we do have senior, uh, we have a senior services uh, unit that ha collects that kind of information. We just didn't want to use it because that was more LA County information and we felt that this was more specific to Glendale seniors. Um, with respect to the senior services committee, um, what's the plan? that when do you anticipate? Well, we go to council on March 6th and if they approve uh, the, the if they approve us uh, creating a senior services committee, what we plan on doing is having quarterly meetings, trying to get people who are senior advocates, seniors themselves, professionals involved and kind of do it organically, see where it takes us. And maybe that first year it'll be four quarterly meetings and then we can kind of see 
can we do maybe monthly meetings? Can they take on events? Can they do other things for us, maybe donations? We, we, we don't know yet. We're still kind of in the first phase. Um, do you already have a, a plan in place with respect to how you're going to be um, doing outreach to obtain the committee members? And we to make don't, sure that I we mean, have, we a have the 37, the people that showed up to the focus group meeting, that's a good number. So we know we have 37 people that were actively involved in that focus group meeting who happened to be the stakeholders themselves. And I know we can outreach even more than that. At this point, we're again on phase one. Are we even going to do it or not? And then afterwards, we're thinking that would be the group that we go to first. Would it be possible for staff to be able to share the list of stakeholders you guys work with? They're actually the first in the time packet. Now? So if you go to the packet, to the senior needs assessment, it's in the <coughs> And all the attendees are there. It's um, appendix uh, three. Six. Actually, I think it's six, isn't it? Or I believe it's appendix six, yes. Four. President Michaels, members of the commission, as for, as for the committee, We'll go ahead and submit 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 names to uh, city manager's office, and we'll work together and um, have a committee of you know 15, 20, 25, whatever the needs are uh, based on our assessment. But all those uh, the names will be submitted to uh, the city manager's office. This is a lot of work this is, and, and great work, by the way. So thank, thank you. you. Um, I had a couple of things. Um, first of all, I want to reiterate, I, I think it is fabulous what you all did, and it's great. I was struck, though, by the huge number of seniors in the community who aren't utilizing services. And, you know, obviously, you were only able to reach 150 people or so with these surveys. Do we have any idea how we can reach more of them? I Running the senior services unit, I can tell you that our, our biggest helpers are the landlords, the tenants themselves that live in buildings that seniors um, live at, as well as out-of-state relatives and people in the community who always give us referrals <coughs> to the kind of the, the, the seniors that are in the background that we don't know about. Um, fire department, police department, they're great social workers. People just don't realize that. They're the ones that actually give us referrals as well as well as discharge planners at the local area hospitals. They also refer to us. So those seniors that are really in need, we do get those referrals. It's just that there were limitations in this, obviously in this needs assessment, but we are outreaching regardless in the sense that our, our case managers are very proactive. Right, I hope that that'll be something that maybe if this committee gets approved, that'll be something they can address. Are we getting special funds uh, to continue to organize more uh, this program? We will see. Um, we had included the funding that we get. It, we have funding from our uh, general fund for our senior programs as well as LA County funds. Our LA County funds uh, cover the case management and elderly nutritional meals program. And at this time, it's been doing wonders for our seniors. I will echo the support for the great work that this is and encourage the efforts specifically on the area of emergency preparation. There are a lot of neighborhood associations, community groups that are working towards that and trying to organize, be able to talk to the city, fire, police, other emergency groups. I would encourage you to have on that agenda talking with some of those other community groups and coordinating with them in that area of emergency preparation because a neighborhood association that is aware of seniors in their neighborhood would be a good resource to check on people when first responders can't. Um, and I trust that with the committee formation, you will continue outreach and continue spreading the survey. That would be a good plan. We're actually considering doing that again because we wanted to get a better blank. We wanted to blanket the city. It was just very difficult to do so in the time frame that we had. 
So we are going to probably have a better survey at hand as the year passes. Yes. President Michaels and commissioners, I think um, based on the survey results and I think just based on staff experience, we've realized that um, as a group, which is where the Servi uh, Senior Services Committee comes in, um, partnering with the community organizations, we'd be able to reach out and do more. Um, and so I think this committee will be the start with bringing everybody in who is currently servicing and putting our resources together to figure out um, what can we do and how can we do, what more can we do and how can we do it better. Um, so I think this is just that first step in um, forming a committee which will allow us, um, our staff, because we do have limited resources and we do have limited grant funding. And so maybe pulling our resources along with what the hospitals have, with what um, you know the, the the senior centers, other senior centers have, and other organizations within our community, and bringing us all together to see what um, each one of us could do to serve better and make sure we're not duplicating efforts. So this is kind of that first step, and I think definitely this committee will probably want to m maybe at some point um, do um, a, a different type of. Uh, survey or assessment and um, be able to figure out uh, how we could better serve the seniors. So this is probably that first step that we're going to take to pull everybody together. This is a great first step and I would encourage and support that formation of the committee. I know it's early in the stages and it's not formed yet or flushed <laughs> out, but I'm supportive of the idea. So far, what kind of community ethnic groups we have been reaching and working with them? What kind of groups have we been yeah. reaching? Ethnic um, groups, like the, they, their needs. Uh, I'm sorry, can you please the Groups repeat? that, uh, the organizations that we have in this community. Oh. Have you approached them and you work with them? And uh, Yes, so we, we had, we contacted the local area hospital representatives, our police and our fire, uh, safety, we contacted the senior complexes, our uh, senior housing, assisted living. We contacted the libraries, our community services and parks uh, supervisors because our seniors frequent those uh, facilities. So we did that, um, as well as our housing department, um, our community development. So we, we did a broad, we, we sent out a broad, uh, the, the flyer to a broad group of people and we had 37 show up. So that was, that was a pretty good starting point. But we do have existing uh, ethnic <coughs> organizations that are more socially oriented to help the elderly or needy people. Are we working with them at all? We are, we're working with very various agencies. For instance, Armenian Relief Society, they had, they had a representative come to our uh, focus group meeting. We sent it out to pretty much everyone that is a social services agency as well. We did. Yeah. If I may add, um, I'd, I'd recommend three groups to be added just as an initial thing. Um, the Armenian uh, American Council on Aging, the Gl uh, Glenda Latino Association, as well as NACASEC that covers the Korean community. I think with, with those three major ones we can possibly. And then with respect to the Armenian American Council on Aging, I know that they, they gather on a daily basis on Colorado, so obtaining, you know, we, when we used to do surveys, we, we used to just really stop by the center and, um, and have them just fill out whatever we needed. Just do that. Thank you. Thank you. And is this list, is this um, a list of places where they allowed you to put the surveys, or is this just, okay. So they you, are, they're the locations we you, actually took the surveys to. But you reached out to others and they we did. did. Okay. We actually reached out to the Armenian American Council on Aging as well. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Sorry, um, President Michaels, is there a motion to accept the report and incorporate the feedback that you provided in order to take the report to council? I'll make the motion. Okay. I move to accept the report and with the feedback that we provided. Um, I second it. Commissioner Call. Sautrin? Yes. Kalfayan? Yes. Wolfson? Yes. Wu absent? 
President Michaels? Yes. Next item, we have item 7B, centralized irrigation controller. President Michael, members of commission, as you know, over the past few years, we have uh, made great attempts in uh, conserving our water uh, in, the, uh, in Glendale, in the park especially. Water is life for us, because without water, we can't grow much. Yet knowing that we are in a drought environment, we have taken great measures in reducing water consumption and repairing irrigation line breaks very quickly. Uh, we have a lot of efforts put in place that we've shared with commission in the past. At this point, what we wanted to share with you is uh, a project we took on last year in converting our standalone irrigation controllers to centralized smart controllers. And we had talked with commission about this project some time back. I want to give you an update as to its status, where we are, and what we have left to see it through uh, to its end. Centralized controllers are essentially smart controllers. And the, the concept of centralized is you can control the entire system from one location. Versus what we, we had uh, just as of last year, every park facility had its own controller. And then if you wanted to make any modifications or change the clock or turn it off, you must go to the site to be able to control it. Well, these new controllers, they are web-based. We could sit here and use it through our iPhone, through our iPad, and be able to control the entire system over water. Such as today, we anticipate some rain coming. Uh, Francisco, who you met, the senior irrigation technician, before he's done with the day, he'll just log in and click off. All of our controllers will be off, or he can just delay it on a seven-day delay, 10-day delay, knowing how many days we expect rain, and then the system will be shut off. We will not be watering. So some of their abilities, as we mentioned, would be to turn on and off from home or office. You can modify schedules. Uh, you can see the water use at each facility to be able to track what kind of water is being used at each facility so we know if any of the staff is turning on the, uh, the, the, the valves and putting extra water in areas when uh, you know, we, we have a very strict zero use water at times. Uh, we tell them to turn things off. We can identify water leaks. We can pull water reports for the entire system. Uh, obviously, it saves time, so we do not have to send staff to 48 different locations. We can just do it all within a couple of clicks. And then, obviously, it saves precious resource water for us. I wanted to show you a screenshot. It is a bit technical for me to go through at this moment. For one, I haven't really played around with this much, but I want to show you how simply uh, staff could log in, change the programs, and then identify starting times and or the days of watering. Uh, uh, to be able to make any changes to the schedule. Because at times, uh, if you could imagine when we have a new sod installed or we're doing a renovation, we put some seed out in the field, we do have to increase the watering frequency to make sure we can grow grass and then modify it back after a certain period of time. For the project background, council allocated $150,000 for this project last fiscal year. Uh, we went through three different vendors who tend to be the most um, um, advanced in this system based on our expertise and analysis, we went through Weathermatic, WeatherTrack, and Rainbird IQ system. And we talked to these vendors and asked them to place their clocks at our park. We wanted to test it out. We wanted to see which one of these clocks fit best for our need. And so we installed them at Pelinconi, Palmer, and Maple Parks, respectively. And then after we did a couple of months of review with each centralized controller, we determined that Rainbird IQ is the ideal for us for Glendale. So we began the purchasing process, and as we went to bid, we received six bids. The lowest was 116,852 by Imperial Irrigation Supply. Uh, we took an opportunity that we had available through Metropolitan Water District. They had the SoCal Water Smart Rebate Program. We applied for every one of our clocks, and depending on the number of, controller, a number of um, stations you have per clock, there is a rebate per station. And we had 67 clocks, and I honestly can't even tell you how many stations throughout every clock, which uh, resulted in a significant dollar amount in rebates. We have to date receive checks in the amount of approximately $54,000, and we're still processing additional rebates that we anticipate should give us approximately 25,000 additional dollars. I mean, with that, based on the purchase price and the rebates we received, the cost of the controllers were merely $37,852. Uh, and we do anticipate water savings with this. Um, I put 10% annually because we are not as lucky as a lot of other areas. Like this year, we've had maybe three days of rain. But in a very good season, where our ability to control with, our, with the system's ability to identify water leaks where we can go and patch things up, 
if, without having somebody notice and report it, I think we are estimating that we could save approximately at minimum 2.7 million gallons of water, uh, which could be a one brand new park, uh, practically being watered on an annual basis. Uh, just a point of clarification, in the report, the number is dollar amount of controller saving rebates is inaccurate. It was, it's 36852 uh, I believe. The estimated cost would be 37 It was a calculation error. I wanted to note that for a commission. Uh, we are installing these clocks using in-house staff. Um, the goal was during the winter season when we have a lot of rain and staff is not able to work on projects, they can get out there and they can install the clocks. Well, Unfortunately, we haven't experienced much rain. And then the amount of uh, projects, as you see on a monthly basis, we put on our staff to a complete and timely basis, including our irrigation staff, we're able to install 47 of the 62 clocks. Uh, you might be thinking, why 62 clocks? We only have 38 parks, 48 park facilities. Well, each park has a different number of clocks. For example, a facility like Brand Park has seven clocks. A sports Complex has seven clocks because each clock can only accommodate up to 48 stations, and given the sheer size of those facilities, you need more stations, hence the need for additional clocks. And uh, the goal is, though, that we'll be finished by the end of March. Staff has promised me we were able to recruit one additional irrigation technician, and so with a team of five individuals, we'll be splitting them to take care of all irrigation-related breaks and uh, um, work orders in the field. Uh, we'll be breaking them off to do projects as well as set aside time. So by the time we meet next time in March, the rest of the clocks will be installed. And then labor costs we're estimating at $7,000 uh, overall based on staff uh, time. And that is essentially the end of this report. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Our goal continues to be to uh, conserve water as best as we can. Uh, after this phase, we're probably going to look at installing uh, additional um, water saving mechanisms in place, such as uh, we have the smart controllers, but the flow sensors that actually can help shut down systems automatically once they determine a leak more than the, the essential gallons per minute program for that clock. So that will be another phase we'll be looking at, looking at in the coming year to make sure we have better control of our water use. Thank you. Are there any questions? This may be a little technical, but you have said that they are internet connected. What connections are you using at all of the locations in the parks? Uh, President Michaels, each system comes through Rainbird has basically a little cell that communicates through a cell tower. So for us, we can log in through, uh, there's a Rainbird IQ login, and they're specifically assigned to individual staff. And we are keeping that only at the supervisor, manager, and irrigation uh, uh, technician uh, levels. So each one will be identified by a PIN. They can log in, they can control it. We can use Internet Explorer, Mozilla, any of your ability to get online. And uh, it's a special um, website through Rainbird to get access to their IQ systems. Okay. I may have a few other technical questions, but we can deal with that offline. Uh, yes, uh, please do, because I may not have all the answers for you, but I'd be, I promise to uh, talk to Francisco and get you the answers you need. Thank you. Sure. Next item, please. Item 7C, Community Center Drop-In Programs Annual Report. Good afternoon, President Michaels, members of the Commission, City staff. My name is Sabah Garibedian, Commun Senior Community Services Supervisor with the Community Services and Parks Department. So I'll be presenting to you our Community Center drop-in report for calendar year 2017. Uh, drop-in <laughs> programs take place at all of our community centers and some of our facilities that have uh, city staff working, uh, which also include the Gondola Sports Complex and Pacific Community Pool. Uh, the programs, our drop-in programs could be age-specific, such as our Todd Time program at Maple Park or at Pacific uh, Community Center, or it could be uh, specific to the type of demographic we attract, such as the Adult Recreation Center and Spar Heights Community Center, which primarily focus on uh, the senior population during the day. Uh, it is, um, they can be duplicated at each facility, or it could also be unique to a facility, such as our facilities offer pool tables, three out of the four community centers offer billiards tables, so we offer drop-in billiards, um, but only Maple Park Community Center has a, a computer lab, so that would be the one that has a drop-in computer lab available to the participants. Uh, the requirements to participate in the drop-in program is uh, you need a uh, community services and parks department activity card. 
a person who doesn't have a card can purchase a day pass and the fees are as follows. Youth 17 and under, uh, the activity card is free so long as they sign the release of liability form. Uh, they have to sign it and their parents need to sign it. Adults 18 to 59, it's $25 per year. Seniors 60 and older, the activity card is $10 per year and the single day pass is $2 per day. <clears throat> and in addition to that, programs that have a, an instructor, basically like a contract class where we pay somebody to teach the class, like our senior fitness classes, um, the, those classes will have an additional dollar per hour drop-in fee. So if it's an hour-long class, it'll cost them an hour, uh, a dollar. If it's a two-hour class, it might cost them two dollars. Uh, Here's a picture of our community centers. Uh, we have, so again, uh, the classes are offered at the Adult <coughs> Recreation Center, Maple Park Community Center, Pacific Community Center, and Spar Heights Community Center. At the Adult Recreation Center, here's some pictures of some of our drop-in programs. Uh, like I mentioned before, billi uh, billiards. We have senior aerobics, our bridge club, uh, backgammon, chess and dominoes, karaoke, knit and chat, muscle toning with weights, open play table tennis. Uh, once a week, we have our senior mixer, tai chi for seniors, and Zumba. At Maple Park, we have youth and adult drop-in basketball, adult uh, volleyball, after school club, drop-in tennis, and talk time, and of course the computer lab. At Pacific Community Center, uh, these are the two main areas where we have our drop-in programs. So we have our recreation room which offers billiards uh, and table tennis. Um, we actually moved that foosball table all the way in the back to Maple Park where, it might get, where it's getting used more. We also offer youth and adult drop-in basketball. Uh, we offer adult badminton Friday nights and we have eight badminton courts lined up there. Uh, we have drop-in soccer on our multi-use field. We offer line dancing, exercise classes for seniors, the recreation room itself, taught time, pickleball, and we offer indoor and outdoor pickleball, as well as uh, billiards and table tennis, like I mentioned before. At Spar Heights Community Center, we have our after school club, our billiards, backgammon, board games, dominoes, board games, which would, may include Scrabble or Mahjong, uh, bingo, yoga, knitting and crocheting, senior chat group, fitness and weight training, specialty fitness, Tai Chi and wood carving. Uh, these are the participation numbers by each facility for calendar year 2017. Um, the first number is the number of drop-in programs we offer at that site. So ARC is at 10, Maple is at six, Pacific is at nine, and Spar Heights is at 10. And you can see ARC takes the cake in terms of the number of participants with 53,404 participants. That's a duplicated number. That's one person visiting multiple times in a year or multiple scan-ins as we, we like to call it, because their activity card, they scan the activity card at the front desk and then we check them in for whatever activity they're going for. Uh, Maple Park had 33,644 visitors, Pacific had 34,000, and Spar Heights had 27,700. Of course, the hours of operation will help with those numbers. ARC is open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday, and we have people waiting for us to open the doors at 8 o'clock in the morning so they could go to the exercise class. Pacific is open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., but it's next to the school, so our daytime foot traffic is less, our evening traffic picks up more. SPAR is, again, like ARC, where it's a senior center, so we get people coming in as soon as we open the doors. For calendar year 2017, uh, we sold the following number in youth activity cards, a total of 521, and you can see the figures broken down. And then for your comparison, I put 2016's numbers next to it. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the data from 2015 because that's when we first implemented our Retrax system and our scanning. So I have two numbers, uh, two years of numbers to really gauge. And in 2017, our adult and senior activity card numbers are there. So we sold or renewed 238 adult passes and we renewed or sold 1,329 senior passes. And then we processed 848 day passes. That's, and the day pass is different than an activity card. We process an activity card once. We don't touch it for 12 months. A day pass, it's somebody could say, I want a day pass for each visit they come. And they could show up once a week and still buy that day pass. So we process day passes as they were checking in 848 times at all four sites. The numbers aren't going to be identical because we have youth day passes in there as well. So you're not going to see the day pass dollar amount multiplied by two to get to <laughs> And then, so of the 2,936 passes processed, 
we generated a revenue of 27, uh, sorry, $20,730. So our drop-in programs are primarily advertised in our leisure guide. Um, the, the leisure guide is our quarterly publication. It's all in there. Um, and it's divided by each community center. So Pacific Community Center will have its listing for youth, adult, and senior drop-in programs. Same with Maple, same with ARC and SPAR. And that concludes my presentation, if you have any questions. Looking at the total number of passes mm -hmm. and then the revenue, mm -hmm. the revenue for the comparison for the last two years is relatively close. Mm -hmm. The number of passes, there's significantly fewer this year. Is there a logic behind that? I, as I was, uh, President Michaels, uh, members of the commission, as I was pulling the numbers, I couldn't find a correlation as to why there's a discrepancy, numbers being close, to, but the revenue being off. Um, unfortunately, there's no way of me tracking how many of it was actual youth, and I can't pick up any glitches. So if somebody renewed their membership card twice, I don't see that uh, when I'm looking into the system. There's times where it doesn't process or staff mishandles that membership, or somebody's membership, they paid, staff processed it incorrectly, two days later it shows it expired, and they process it again. So it's up to me to go back and correct that pass. So now I say, okay, this person paid twice in theory, so I extend out their membership for two years. So those are the nuances that I've been trying to work with staff on. And uh, there is one of our facilities, it wasn't recording the data as they were scanning in as well. So it's been a, um, it's been a guessing game as to why the numbers have been different every single year. So I'm hoping next year, with the way I've reprogrammed all of our drop-in classes this year, starting January of 2018, by next year I'll get better numbers, and over three, uh, three years of time, I could better speculate what's going on and where our hiccups are. Now, I appreciate that this is the start, and with just two years, it's hard to find correlations. Do you have any recommendations of, I understand you're working with the system, do you have any recommendations of how you might try to improve it? Um, President Michaels, members of the commission, at the current time, no. Um, we've got, we feel like we've finally got a good handle on the system and what it will and what it won't accept. Um, we're looking at alternatives and we're also looking at upgrading our system too. Um, when we first bought the customer reservation system that handles all our facility permits, our class registration, all of that, um, they said you use this version, which is 10.3, which is uh, desktop based and uh, it sits on a server. And then the next version, which was already available, uh, will be online based, sitting on a server somewhere else. Um, that's the next version that we're trying to upgrade to. And we've talked to the company, our vendor, and it's saying some of those issues will be corrected once you, you make that transition to the next phase. And we're looking at possibly moving that migration towards the end of this year after our summer programs are done so that staff could focus on the proper migration of the database as opposed to <laughs> summer camp and all our summer programming. So hopefully that will be able to address some of our issues. Thank you. There's no other questions. I think we're ready for the next item. Item 70, Customer Service Office and Filming Annual Report. Good afternoon, uh, President Michaels and members of commission. My name is Eileen Asayan, Community uh, Services Supervisor overseeing the Customer Service Office, and I'm here to present the 2017 Annual Report. For 2017, our community building reservation information was we had 517 building reservations uh, for the reporting period. Um, these are the buildings that we do reserve, Dunsmore, Brands Studios, Joe Bridges Clubhouse, and Griffith Manor Community Building. For the park reservations, we had a total of 789 park reservations. We've seen an increase due to uh, reopening of Palmer Park and additional two special event sites. These are some of the favorites that we have among clients, uh, Casa Adobe, Kathleen Verdugo Adobe, Brand Friendship Garden, and Lower Shoal Canyon. For film, per for film permit, for film per no. Well, I'll just go ahead. For film permits, uh, 36 film permits were pro processed in this pay period. In this uh, period, we've seen a 
great increase at sports complex and brand studios and brand parks. And we've seen large companies coming into our facilities for filming. So that's been a um, exciting news for this year. For a fiscal impact, uh, facility reservations 61%, film permits 13, registrations 25, photo permits 1%. Continuing with fiscal impact, uh, we've seen an increase in facility reservations, but we've also seen an increase on maintenance operations to, in, you know, taking care of the facilities and maintaining them. And that is my report. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item. Excuse me. Item 7E, Section Activity Reports at One Recreation and Community Services. President Michaels, the report is um, in the packet. I'm not sure if, the, if you guys have any questions, but I did want to highlight one item, um, one event that took uh, place this weekend on Saturday at Palmer Park, which we didn't get a chance to put in the report because the reports came out on Friday. But um, in collaborating with the Glendale Police Department, we had the uh, Shield on the Field event on um, Saturday at Palmer Park. And this was, um, this was actually an event that was brought to us by the Glendale Police Department after the presentation at Commission where they wanted to show more presence out in the parks and uh, considering the concerns we had at Palmer Park, we decided that Palmer would be the best park to start with. And so this is something that I think we're going to, or we're hoping to co continue to collaborate on and take to different parks in Glendale. But this gave an opportunity for the police officers to show presence at the park, very informal. Um, we had some um, basketball competition. The, the officers were there and uh, the youth that came um, had an opportunity to shoot some hoops and um, I believe play three on three basketball and also we had staff at the skate park. Um, we waited for uh, youth to, to gather up and then we had some skate competitions. And so um, the parents got to mingle with the officers <laughs> and staff. We had um, five departments from uh, five various city departments like the library department, our own department had a booth, um, I believe um, economic development, community development was there as well. And so we had booths where we had the opportunity to take questions and um, mingle with the community while the police officers got to talk with the neighbors and hear their concerns and show presence at the park. So just wanted to report that that was a very successful event. We had the mayor attend, I believe the um, acting police chief was there. Um, we had staff there and so I uh, just wanted to let you know that it was a successful event and I think um, we're both planning on uh, bringing it back to other parks. They'll also piggyback um, some of our existing events. For example, we have the uh, spring extravaganza so police department will be there. They're, I mean, they're already there but the um, crime impact team will be there as well to be able to establish relationships. So. That's something that we are um, hopefully going to have at various parks throughout the city at some point, uh, considering the resources. Thank you. I think that's a very good, very good relationship to work on. Um, I have a comment about something that was discussed during the last meeting, and I'm not sure when to bring it up. I don't know when would be the appropriate time. Um, was it specific to Palmer Park or? It, it, yes. It is true. It, Go ahead. It's, it, I know that there were discussions about um, concerns that were raised about Palmer Park. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here during the last meeting. I just want to know what the steps are going to be from the staff with respect to providing a report because I have my own concerns about, you know, proceeding with addressing those issues. Uh, in terms of a report, we brought it to commission last uh, uh, last meeting, but what we've done the past month is we worked on the timer for the lights. The lights are turning off at 8 p.m. Uh, instead of 8.30. Um, 8 p.m. plus we ordered some signs, uh, signs stating, uh, you know, respect your uh, neighbors, no noise, and so on. We're working with the police department uh, for them to increase their patrols, and um, that's about it for now. There aren't going to be any steps to reduce the activities right any further no okay no. I just I mean I, I really I know I, I wasn't here last time but I want to kind of be on the record on this because I you know we don't have adequate parks and green space to begin with 
and I very much respect the neighbors that you know came to voice their opinions on on this issue and I think that the staff and the city has gone above and beyond in attempting to address those issues um, but in all honesty, when you're purchasing a home or moving next to a park, it's very similar to moving to next to a school and then complaining that you have traffic at 7.30 a.m. every morning. So I think I wanted to commend you all for um, always being very responsive, but I also wanted to make sure that we're not reducing anything any further because I was absent last time. Uh, President Michaels, members of the commission, uh, we haven't been reducing. Um, like I mentioned in the meeting last, uh, last month, we would like to keep a status quo but we will be working closely with the police department, with our neighbors in the area, and if there are any issues that we can tackle, uh, we will, uh, without changing the programming of the facility. Uh, we will be, uh, like I mentioned earlier, adding a few more signs, um, working with the police department, and I know there, were, there was another request from one of the neighbors that we'll be uh, working on with them, but as for programming, the park is open till or 10 o'clock. availability o of the park, or use of the park. Yeah, the park is open till 10 o'clock, uh, but the uh, basketball courts and the uh, skate park um, closes at 8. Uh, with that being said, we turn off the lights at 8 o'clock. Yes. Thank you. Next item. Item 7, E at 2, Park Services. So, President Michael, members of commission, the Park Services report for the month of January, we completed 119 work orders of which 96 were completed by groundskeepers and 23 by the irrigation repair crew for a total of 866 labor hours. And uh, some of the projects we'd like to highlight today, uh, they date back to December because we did not make a presentation. Well, December was canceled in January. I did not make a presentation. So some of these projects date back to the month of December through January. Uh, one of the projects we completed was at the Environmental Management Center. We work closely with our fire department. Their entryway and the side uh, landscaping had overgrown, and they requested for us to come and do a nice cleanup and re-landscape. So as typical, our staff went through and cleaned out all the overgrown uh, the shrubbery. Uh, we adjusted the irrigation, get it prepped for landscaping. We installed uh, walkways, little pavers, so the company that comes in to maintain our, our landscape contractor has the ability to get to some of these areas and maintain the landscape. Um, the front entrance was given the, uh, the most effort given that it is the main entryway. Uh, of course, after we finish every project, we mulched it and doesn't look uh, very close up, but this is the far shot of the project completed at the, uh, the EMC. The second project was a uh, replacement of the bench that was damaged at the Seven Trees Trail. Now this was a very interesting project because it required hauling all of the material to Seven Trees Trail. An entire crew, project crew, uh, uh, was dedicated to this project because it was quite a bit of material. And they uh, recruited me to uh, get some exercise as well. Um, we got up to the, uh, the trail, the, the flat area of the Seven Trees. We dug for the replacement and we created a, an X mechanism. So when we put the bench in, it would be clamped by metal bars. We put holes through the, the, the centerpiece, and that way we'd be able to uh, hold it in place and not have it disappear. Of course, uh, staff wants to make sure the bench is level, nobody's tipping on either side. Here's how we're clamping it down. And we even had to haul some concrete all the way up there, bags of concrete to be able to, uh, water and concrete, to be able to secure the bench. And here's the bench. This was the bench that was damaged that's replaced um, at that location. While we were there, uh, given some of the uh, complaints by the hikers and the residents that uh, once the, uh, the fire line was created, it created a gap that people were using to go to non-accessible uh, areas of the park, areas that were not trails before, looked like they were trails. Hence, we uh, created signs in the office to direct people through the appropriate library trail and then uh, identify the path that is not a trail, even though it looks like one, please don't go this way. Um, unfortunately, these signs did not last too long. Some people took them out. In this exact location, we had to come back this past month, and we had to cut some shrubbery and then plant shrubbery six feet high in the entire area and made another sign, probably three times as big, to point people to the right direction. Just for commission and the public's information, we are working with a uh, contractor 
we are trying to finalize a purchase order to get them onto the site to do all kinds of enhancements and repair the Seven Trees Trail. Uh, that is in the works. We're looking at finalizing it because we want to know the cost of adding some additional benches, some kiosks, and want to incorporate that as one project. So bear with us. We are working on it, and it should be coming in the uh, next couple of months. Uh, City Hall, the back entrance to the... Um, the garage, this is essentially the staff entrance, and it has a little break area on the side. We were requested to come in and uh, remove some of the materials stored uh, to be able to re-landscape the area. We worked with our colleagues in Public Works in removing some of the bins that they use, created a flat area for them that they can put larger bins and put their equipment and supplies that they use because their garage is over there. Uh, our staff had to go in, realign, readjust the irrigation, put in new lines, put in new borders for a DG pathway. And then, uh, of course, when you put in the DG, you wanna make sure it's compacted. What you see here is being compacted so it stays in place, um, raked, landscaped. And when we're finished on the opposite side to the entrance, we also put in some uh, uh, trees to be able to block the area off. Eventually when they grow in, they will feel like a landscape and the area where the storage bins will go will be kind of secluded from the public's eye. Here is again the right side of the entrance and the landscape. And for our uh, colleagues at City Hall to take the break here, this is a, uh, a very welcomed project. Museum of Neon Art. We actually were approached by the folks at Museum of Neon Art at the Paseo. The landscape at the Paseo, they wanted us to do an enhancement. So we work with members of the Theodore Payne Foundation. They're a nonprofit organization, and one of their representatives came out. We sat down, discussed their potential landscape. They assisted us with designing what the landscape would be, and we got the uh, uh, we discussed it with the Downtown Glendale Association. Everybody had their blessings, so we took on the project, removed the existing landscape. A lot of the landscape that was there and was thriving, we actually moved to alternate locations. So the two planters we had were split, and we brought very minimal new landscape, and we're able to complete this project in a very short turnaround uh, with the support of uh, the Theodore Payne Foundation with giving us the design. And these are pictures of it as of today with, uh, with it being mulched and finalized. Uh, we had two projects, Car Park and Palinconi Park, exercise fitness equipment. Uh, as we had talked about before, we're looking at expanding these fitness equipments throughout our parks because they're a great resource for the community. No matter where, whatever we put them, the public uses them on a daily basis. Uh, the project at Car Park was a simpler one because we had a large concrete area that was not being used. Uh, hence, we worked with a vendor, came in, designed, did the layout. Our staff, uh, along with the, uh, the vendor, they came out, they identified where the ideal locations would be uh, with the equipment being unloaded and bolted in place. And the day we opened this, we already had people using it. I tried it myself, and th these equipment actually use your body weight to be able to, uh, it allows you to actually do physical exercise because you're only basing it off your body weight and doesn't have any uh, specialized compressors to uh, force you to do the work. So these are good equipment we have out there. They've come in quite handy. Uh, and we have, in both sides, we'll have at least a couple of uh, ADA wheelchair accessible equipment as well. So folks with disabilities are going to be able to use these equipment as well. There are rules and regulation signs that tells you how to safely use the equipment. We have it both sides as well, based on the vendors and manufacturers' recommendations. And at Palanconi Park was a bit more challenging because it wasn't a concrete pad, it was a landscape area. And a portion of the landscape area, there were uh, some uh, plants that we had to be removed, and then one tree that was growing into the fence line between the ball field and the uh, walkway. So uh, we had to remove this tree, and removing the tree, we had to deal with a lot of uh, the tree roots. Our staff went in, cleared the entire area, and have it prepped for the installation. Uh, before installation, we had to pour concrete, so we worked closely with our um, colleagues in Public Works, the concrete crew. They came in and they poured the concrete. The equipment came in uh, about a month after. Our staff working with the vendor installed the equipment. And then we had to cut lines to be able to make sure the areas we left landscape, uh, we get irrigation there. So our staff came through, they cut through the concrete, put irrigation on the other side. At the same time, we noticed some areas of the pathway, the walkway had some damage and they were broken. Uh, we again worked with our uh, colleagues in Public Works. They came in, helped us out. We cleared the entire area, and they poured new concrete, so we have a new walkway and exercise equipment that is ADA accessible at Pelincony Park.
These are the, uh, uh, the, the equipment at that location. There were six equipment here and seven equipment over at Car Park. And a couple of these equipment are also ADA accessible uh, along with the rules and regulations signs to let people know how to use the equipment. That is the end of my report for this morning. Are there any comments? Well, thank you. We missed the report last meeting. We're happy to get at this one. Thank you. Is there any other items? No more items. Okay. Move to adjourn.